morning. Isn't it great to be here to celebrate the grace of God? Can I hear that a little louder? Amen. 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 I wanted to mention that we are having a uh, election of our nominating committee. Uh, if you would like to nominate someone yourself, there's a box out back. Just make sure that they've said yes before you, uh, you do nominate them. We need to know that for sure that they're willing to do it. But we need good leadership in our church. We hope that all of you are considering how you might be more involved. It's very important. Also, I'm going to start my Bible study back up. It won't be this Thursday. It'll be the following Thursday. And uh, if you'd like to be on the list to join us for that Zoom Bible study on Thursdays, uh, let me know. Send me an email, and we'll get you set up for that. Um, are there any other announcements we need to make today? Join me in our call to worship. An encounter with Jesus will give us new priorities. An encounter with Jesus will change our circle of friends. An encounter with Jesus will disrupt our way of life. This is a new hymn, but it's well worth singing. Number 314, like the murmur of the dove's song. Let's stand together and sing it. Like the murmur of a dove's song, like the challenge of her flight, like the vigor of her swing, like the new flame's eager might. Come, Holy Spirit, come. To the members of Christ's body, to the branches of the vine, to the church in faith assembled, to her midst as gift and sight. Come, Holy Spirit, come. With the healing of division, with the ceaseless voice of prayer, with the power to love and witness, with the peace beyond compare, come, Holy Spirit, come. Be seated. Come. <laughs> Trying to figure out who's doing what. Let's do our confession of sins using the words printed in your bulletin. Join with me first together and then in a moment of silent confession. Together, all knowing God, we confess our fear and anxiety when we are not in control. We admit our worrying consumes our hearts and makes us blind to what you are doing in the world. We want to set the rules we want to control who is in and who is out. We confess that we have become focused on only a small circle of loved ones, ignoring the rest of creation to fend for themselves. With one voice, we repent all of the wrong we have done, including all of the sins we did not realize were sinful at the time, and all of the sin to which we still cling so tightly. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord. 
that Jesus died for us, that Jesus' death means we are forgiven in God's sight. Thanks be to God. Amen. Beginning a, a new sermon series this season. Uh, last week, Pastor Dave preached about an encounter with Jesus for someone who was on the outside, specifically the woman at the well. And so this whole series is about people in scriptures and how they encountered Jesus. And coming up in the future, uh, we've got one about a wedding. Jesus encountered the wedding guests. We've got one where Jesus encounters Mary and Martha, who are grieving the loss of their brother. Jesus' encounter with the enemy, Satan, um, among many others. Um, today's topic is sort of following up with last week's topic. So last week we talked about the outsider, and today we are talking about the insider. So Jesus encounters the insider, Nicodemus. Now, when we think about insiders and outsiders, when we think about people who are in the middle, in the know, in positions of power, where does Jesus fit into that? Is Jesus an insider? And is Nicodemus, you know, and Jesus both on the inside and they're encountering each other? Or is Jesus on the outside? And if you were going to place yourself in that dynamic, where would you be? Would you be on the inside? Or would you be on the outside? Or would you be wherever Jesus is? I think a lot of us, our default way of thinking is that, oh, well, well Jesus, Son of God, clearly Jesus must be in the know. Jesus is powerful. God is powerful. Jesus must be an insider, right? Right? That might be true for us today, but that was not true at all 2,000 years ago. In fact, Jesus was very much an outsider. Jesus was the kind of person that the insiders wish would just go away. And in fact, they tried to get rid of him by having him executed. But Jesus came back. 
So Jesus is not an insider. Jesus is an outsider, which means that Nicodemus, who is on the inside, has to leave his comfort zone to go and encounter Jesus. Our scripture is from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one else can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Well, Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? The word of the Lord. Does anyone feel like they totally understand everything going on in this story? Okay, at least one person shaking their head no. Uh, I read this scripture multiple times this week and was like, wait, what is he talking about there? What does that mean? Why is that important? Pharisee, what's a Pharisee? Um, so in order to really understand this story, we need to go back in time, go back 2,000 years ago and understand who were the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were Jewish leaders. They were a group of Jewish rabbis, but they were a very powerful and very wealthy group of leaders. But they were also kind of like the social conservatives of their day. They were the people who wanted to preserve the Jewish culture and the Jewish teachings and the Jewish religion, their practices, their religion, their festivals, uh, all of those things, their language, they were the ones who were trying to hold on to that and not let it change. If we remember, uh, at this time, Israel was under control of the Roman Empire, and in Jesus' day, they spoke Hebrew and they spoke Aramaic, but the New Testament, which was written within a generation, is all written in Greek. So the Greek language was sort of sweeping across the region, along with a whole bunch of other traditions and ways of doing things that came along with the Roman Empire. And this group of Jewish leaders was like, no, we don't want change. We want to preserve who we are as a people. They were the orthodox group. They had the strictest interpretations of the rules. They were kind of like the modern-day equivalent would be Baptists, or maybe the Amish. They didn't want change. Now, I presume that not all of the Pharisees were bad, but John the Baptist called them a brood of vipers, so it's safe to assume that most of them were bad and corrupt. So this is kind of, let me give you a, a breakdown of what it was that Jewish leaders, that rabbis would do back then, because it was all about the law. Now, of course, the law, we sometimes think about that being the Ten Commandments. Well, there were more than just the Ten Commandments. There were over 600 laws that the Jewish people had to follow. 
Uh, and for us, to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, but for them, the way to get salvation was to follow the rules. And when you have 600 rules, that's a lot of rules to follow. Uh, and so the Jewish rabbis, they would teach, and they would teach what the rules mean and how we interpret them. Um, and so one of the things they would often talk about is how do you know which law means what? So, for example, take the fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath. What does that mean? What constitutes work and what is not work? When does the Sabbath begin? And, and if you don't have a, you know, a cell phone from 2021 that can tell you exactly what time it is, how do you know when to start keeping the Sabbath? And how do you know when the Sabbath has ended? Uh, and then what is work? You know, Work for some is walking long distances. Okay, well, how many distance, how long of a distance am I allowed to walk on the Sabbath? And this is the kinds of things that the rabbis would get into, and they would explain and teach, and like, oh, well, you can take this many steps, but uh, if you're on your property, your steps don't count. It's only when you leave your property. But if you put a string around your house and around your neighbor's house, then it's like it's one property, so all the steps you take in there don't count. And it gets very complicated. The other thing rabbis would teach is, well, what if you have to choose between following one law and breaking another, or vice versa? So take, for example, the fifth commandment. Anyone know what the fifth commandment is? I, I think I heard it. Honor your father and your mother. I can't tell who's talking with the masks on. Ah, oh, there we go, right there. Good job. Yeah, fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. So now imagine this. The Sabbath has begun. You're on your way to go worship, doing the things you do on Sabbath to keep the Sabbath, but you find out your parents need some help. Well, do you go do some work at their house to help them, or do you keep the Sabbath and go to worship? Which commandment is more important? And those of us who follow Jesus, who follow the rabbi Jesus and his teaching and his interpretation of the law, I think most of us would say, uh, yeah, you go help your parents. Worship can wait, especially because you can just hit play on YouTube later that night. But these are the kinds of things that the rabbis would get into. And of course, whichever rabbi had the best interpretation of the law and the best teaching, maybe the one that was the easiest to follow, that rabbi would have the most followers. Now, a rabbi's interpretation of the law was called his yoke. And there's a scripture verse from Matthew 11, 28. Uh, and so when you hear the word yoke, it's talking about the teaching of the rabbi. And so Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is being a rabbi in this moment. And he is telling people that his interpretation of the law, his yoke, is a lot easier than all the other rabbis who've made it way too complicated. And so because Jesus is teaching this yoke that is easy and this light burden, Jesus is, of course, getting a lot of followers and many of the Jewish people are like, yeah, we don't want to have anything to do with the Pharisees. They're too strict. We're going to go follow Jesus. So the Pharisees, of course, they don't like this. They don't like losing followers. Think of this as like a popularity contest for the first century. And the rabbis, the Pharisees, were losing. And of course, with that, it also meant they were going to lose their way of life. They were going to lose their traditions. They were going to lose their customs. They were going to lose their language. All of this was at stake for them. So there's this other moment in Matthew 22 where Jesus encounters the rabbis, and they're trying to trick him. Uh, and, and as I get ready to read this scripture, I hope it's not coming up. Okay, it's not one of the future sermon series. I didn't want to... I don't want to steal Dave's thunder right in this moment. Um, so the, the Pharisees, they ask Jesus, they say, Teacher, which commandment in the law is greatest? 
And they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus to say something that is heretical, to say something that is blasphemous. They're trying to trip him up and, and make his followers not want to follow him because they think that everything he's teaching is just total garbage. And Jesus responds to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. See, Jesus takes all 600 rules and simplifies it down to just two. Love God, love your neighbor. That's simple. That's what he means by my yoke is easy. Now, somebody worked really hard to turn the Ten Commandments into over 600 commandments. And that guy was pretty ticked off that Jesus had now taken it back down to just two. So the Pharisees, including Nicodemus, they're like, we got to get rid of this Jesus guy. And this struggle, this strife between the Pharisees and Jesus is, is what the the, the Gospels, this is the story that the Gospels is, are telling. If the Gospels were made into a movie, this would be the main plot line. Jesus and the disciples, this sort of cat and mouse game as it goes on, eventually ending in Jesus' arrest, trial, and death. But Nicodemus is, well, he's, he's willing to give Jesus a chance. He's a Pharisee, yes. But he also sees the miracles that Jesus is doing and realizes that no one could do all of those miracles and signs unless they were truly from God. So Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus, and you have these, this sort of clash of personalities. You have Jesus, who is the like big picture, free minded thinker, you know, expand your horizons. And then you got the Pharisee Nicodemus, who's very much do things by the letter of the law, do things in order, follow the rules, follow the instructions. And Jesus is like, you got to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, you can't do that. You can't go back inside a woman's womb. That's like a, that's like a one-way trip. You just, you can't do it. And Jesus is like, well, clearly we're not talking about actual physical birth and wombs and hospitals and babies like like obviously this is a metaphor and Nicodemus is like yeah you can't do that you can't you can't go back in and Nicodemus they have this conversation goes on and, and then you get to one of my favorite lines where Jesus is you can you can hear the frustration in Jesus's voice and Jesus is like we told you about what we saw and witnessed, and it has to do with earthly stuff, and you didn't get it, so obviously you're not going to get it when we start talking about the really important stuff. It's also in the context of this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus where the words of John 3.16 are first uttered. I don't need to quote it for you. You all know John 3.16. But now imagine Jesus is talking to this Pharisee, this guy who kind of wants Jesus to go away. They're sort of enemies. And, and, and Nicodemus is a little thick-skulled. And now Jesus is, is expounding these most important words. This is, this is our story. This is what's going on here. And there's one more piece of the context that we haven't really talked about yet, and that's that this is happening in the middle of the night. And this is before people stayed up all night doing things because they didn't have light bulbs back then. So here's my question. Why did Nicodemus come to Jesus in the middle of the night? Best I can come up with is, is three possible answers. One possibility, Nicodemus was disturbed. He was just really shaken by all of this stuff that Jesus is teaching, and he couldn't sleep, so he goes to Jesus in the middle of the night. Number two, 
It was an emergency, and it needed to be dealt with right away. I don't really know if it was an emergency, because this happens pretty early on in the Gospel of John, so pretty early on in the plot, you know, that they're not really trying to kill Jesus yet. Um, and Nicodemus is so thick-skulled, he, he can't wrap his head around, you know, being born again. So it's not really an emergency for him. Which brings us to our third choice, which is the one I think it, it probably is, and that was that Nicodemus was afraid. Nicodemus was ashamed, and he didn't want anyone else to know that he was having meetings with Jesus. So Nicodemus goes in the middle of the night, he has a secret meeting with Jesus. And Nicodemus hears the words of John 3.16, and he comes to believe. He comes to understand. Nicodemus is taking this big risk even talking to Jesus because all of Nicodemus's close friends think Jesus is a loser. So Nicodemus is going out on an edge, out on a ledge here to even talk to Jesus. Nicodemus is really willing to risk his power, his wealth, his status, and his circle of friends to learn from Jesus. So my question for you is, are you willing to be like Nicodemus? Are you willing to risk your status in life to follow Jesus? In the United States today, it's, it's pretty easy to call yourself a Christian. Going to church is not illegal. None of you are going to get arrested or lynched as you leave this place because you were here. Our culture, our cultural norm, especially here in the South, is that you go to church and that you are a Christian. In fact, it's so baked into who we are as a, as a Christian people and as a nation that some people think the United States is a Christian nation. And I suppose we should say thanks to God that we don't have to worry about fear of death and persecution for just going to church. It wasn't always that easy to be a Christian. But it still begs the question, what are you willing to risk? Maybe another way to ask this question is, what are you unwilling to risk? What request of God would make you walk out of this door, say, no, God, not doing that, and never come back? What is it that you hold back from God? What is it that would make you throw in the towel? If God said, get rid of your TV to be a better Christian, would you do it? If God said, sell your house and move to Malaysia, would you do it? If God said, get a different car or have no car at all, would you do it? If God said, go out and fight for the oppressed and stand up against systemic racism, would you do it? If God said, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly, would you do it? Nicodemus was an insider. Nicodemus was in a position of power and wealth. We know from later on in the Gospel of John, after Jesus dies, Nicodemus brings 75 pounds of perfume and spices to embalm Jesus's body. Any of you got 75 pounds of perfume at home? That's a lot of perfume. Would have cost a lot of money. That's who Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was an insider, and Jesus said, you need to go outside. Jesus asked Nicodemus to give up his power and status to be a follower. 
And when God does the same thing to us today, do we listen? I always imagine Nicodemus walking home at the end of the night with a heavy heart, thinking to himself, stupid Jesus. I know I have those moments in my life where God confronts me and reminds me to do the things that I said I would do in my ordination vows, and I'm like, stupid Jesus, making me love my neighbor. It's hard. But this is the calling. To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God, to love God with your heart, your mind, your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? I think we're going to sing a hymn now, hymn number 308. Please stand with me as we sing. We say an affirmation of faith on Sundays to remind ourselves of all the great truths of the gospel. And so we say together that, that affirmation of faith we call the Apostles' Creed. Now together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Shall we pray together? Oh Lord, we are so uh, going through difficult times. It seems that hopelessness and despair are crouching, ready to pounce upon us. We wonder how we can make it through each day. And if we took so seriously all the suffering across the world, perhaps it would be difficult to make it through each day. But instead, Lord, we know that while we can't understand everything that's happening, we know, Lord, that you are with us. And what we face, we face not alone, but with you. And so we pray, Lord, that we might gain the strength that we need, the understanding that we need to know, and the hope that sustains us. And may we be able to move out into action that builds our faith. For we know, Lord, ultimately that you are in charge and that we belong to you, and day by day, every day, you are with us no matter what we're going through. And so while people suffer around us and we suffer a little ourselves, Lord, we know that you are still the Lord of the universe, and we will do our best to trust in you. Fill us, in your, fill us with your spirit that that might be possible, Lord, that we may be able to go beyond ourselves into that region where we can trust you no matter what. Thank you for giving us a prayer that helps us know how to pray. We say that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are grateful for your generosity, both those of you that are with us today and those who are at home. We think that's a way that you can gain joy, even in the midst of what we're going through, is by being generous. So we ask that once again, be generous with your church and with the kingdom of God's work that we do. Lord, uh, take what we have, take what we have, multiply it. May it become even more useful to you and to the church as we give it to you. And help us to take joy out of what we give. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for the work that you do through what we give. It's amazing. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is a hymn of the Reformation. The text was written by John Calvin, and the music is from the Genevan Psalter. I greet thee who my sure redeemer art, number 457. Please stand and sing with me.
us by thy faith and by thy power, and give us strength in every trying hour. Thou hast a true and perfect gentleness, no harshness Make us calm and true.